Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everybody out here in the uh, in the auditorium, as well as you folks on the uh, on connecting with us on Zoom this afternoon. I appreciate you being here. And uh, for the next oh, I don't know, five six hours, we're going to go through you know uh, every day of Lee's life from uh, April of eighteen sixty one to April of eighteen sixty five. No. Uh, just kidding, of course. Uh, just going to pick up some of the highlights along the way. Uh, like Lori said, my uh, newest book came out last year from Arlington to Appomattox, and it is kind of a reference book, kind of not a reference book. I'm not really sure what you would qualify it as. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with uh, E.B. Long's Civil War Day by Day or the Lincoln Day by Day book, uh, they are what the title says they are. They, they give you a day-by-day -day look, either at an event or at a person during a specific time period, pinning down everything that can be pinned down to a specific date on the calendar. And that is what I have, have, uh, have done here with General Lee. And uh, there's a lot of things in the book that uh, I think most folks are familiar with. There's a lot of things that uh, folks are not familiar with. And I'll go through and uh, present some of both of those to you today. Uh, whenever I give this presentation, I like to, to start out by going back in time to whatever the particular day is and see what Lee was doing on that particular date during the war. Uh, January 19th, that's an easy one. I can tell you exactly what he was doing on uh, January 19th of 1807. Uh, he was busy being born right about now. Uh, but uh, if we uh, look at what Lee was doing on January 19th of 1862, uh, I don't do math, so I'm not even going to try and figure out how many years ago that is. Uh, it was uh, Lee's 55th birthday. Uh, he spent the day at his headquarters in South Carolina, and uh, he's writing to his son. Uh, he's talking about what he thinks the war means for Lee himself and for the Lee family. He's particularly worried about uh, facing economic ruin, and that is exactly what the war <laughs> would do to him. Uh, and also, uh, he's uh, also writing to Custis about uh, some family business. Uh, uh, he is, uh, he's heard that one of Custis's friends is engaged uh, to another friend, and uh, he's asking if the man is of good character and worthy of uh, marrying this young lady. And uh, then he also uh, provides a brief update on the military situation in South Carolina and Georgia. And what was Lee doing in South Carolina and Georgia? That's a good question. We'll get to that here shortly in just a moment. But I'm going to do my presentation kind of in two parts today. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about, uh, well, what do we know about Lee? What, the things that we do know about him, where do they come from? And then uh, for the second part, I'm actually going to look at, uh, like I mentioned, some of the little tidbits of Lee's life during the uh, time period 1861 to 1865. Uh, there's been probably more written about Robert E. Lee than any other figure of the American Civil War, except maybe Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the, really, the, the seminal work when you're talking about a Lee biography uh, is this one, the four-volume biography, R.E. Lee, that was written back in the 30s by Douglas Freeman. Uh, he would receive the, the Pulitzer Prize for this particular biography. And uh, a lot of what we know, uh, the, really the, the popular image up until the last uh, decade or so of Lee really comes from Freeman. Uh, Freeman, uh, he spent more time studying and writing about Robert E. Lee than really anyone else. He probably knew more about Lee than some of Lee's own children knew about him. And uh, Freeman would make the claim at one point in life that he could account for every hour of Lee's life from West Point until his death. Uh, he was exaggerating, but not by much. Uh, really, uh, like I say, Freeman uh, spent decades writing about this man. He had not just the four-volume uh, Pulitzer Prize biography. He did the three-volume Lee's Lieutenants, which looked at the history of the Army in Northern Virginia. He edited a previously unknown collection of Lee's papers. He did a kid's book about Lee. He was the one who organized the, uh, the papers at what became the Museum of the Confederacy. Uh, so really, Freeman and Lee go hand in hand. And if you want a, a, really the most detailed biography, even today, about Lee remains Freeman. That said, it's not going to be the most uh, balanced and impartial uh, look about, uh, about the general. Uh, Freeman 
was kind of given to hero worship. I don't think that was his intention, but that's a risk that every biographer and historian uh, runs when they're writing about their subject, the, the possibility of getting too attached and too sympathetic to it. And that is really what happened with Freeman there at one point in his writing. Uh, even though it is a, a great piece of literature, a great biography, if you read through these four volumes, you won't find much at all that reflects on Lee in a, in a bad light. Uh, Freeman, you know, he, he really did not think that, that Lee was capable of, of doing certain things. For instance, if you things that I've uncovered uh, that Freeman either knew about and hid or did not care to, to process or whatever, for whatever reason, they don't appear in, uh, in Freeman's biography. The big one, Lee ordered his staff to fire on their own men at Sharpsburg in a moment of desperation. And uh, that's one of those things that you don't see written about anywhere. But I, I, one of his staff uh, wrote that it happened. Uh, you don't read about Lee's temper in Freeman. You don't read about the fact that Lee was really not a, a good person to work for. He made uh, he really made life difficult for the young men who were attached to A and B headquarters. Uh, so what's the point of that? Lee's human, just like everybody else. Uh, he's not this marble man, but he, he's also not the the villain that some folks uh, make him out to be. He was a normal human being with with ups and downs. But. Again, how do we know what we know about Lee? Well, some of it, of course, comes from his own writing, uh, his own papers, his own correspondence, both official and personal, uh, you know, the reports to Richmond, as well as letters to his wife and kids and uh, acquaintances and other uh, family members during the war. Uh, but the one thing that a lot of historians limit that we don't have is a history of the war by Lee himself. And uh, he actually intended to write such a critter. Uh, he started working on that towards the end of his life when he was in Lexington, the president at Washington College, what's now Washington and Lee. He started gathering material for it, but he didn't get very far. He, he died five years after the war. So he, like I say, he did not get very far in this process, but he wanted to do it. And here is him telling one of his cousins that. A history of the military events of the period would be desirable. And I've had it in view to write one of the campaigns in Virginia in which I was particularly engaged. I've already collected some materials for the work, but lack so much that I wish to obtain that I have not commenced the narrative. And like I say, he, he died before he ever put pen to paper on this. And there are some, like General John Gordon, uh, who were really upset that Lee never got a chance to, to, put, his, uh, to put his thoughts and uh, his recollection, his side of things, if you will, down on paper. Gordon, of course, wrote one of the, the greatest accounts of the war, uh, Reminiscences of the Civil War, most of it's pure fiction and existed only in Gordon's mind, but it's still one of the most readable accounts uh, from either side that you will find. Um, Gordon was a very gifted writer. Lee was not. If you ever read anything that Lee put out for public consumption, it's some of the driest stuff that you'll ever read. Uh, before he started work on the, the, his history of the war, he edited his father's Revolutionary War memoirs and he wrote the introduction to it. And that is some of the driest stuff you will ever read. I, I, Hey, it'll, if you're having trouble at sleep, getting to sleep at night, read the introduction to that. Uh, so I think it's probably better for history and for Lee that we don't have that, because I think the uh, uh, really um, the image that a, a lot of folks have of Lee, I think it would really be diminished uh, just because he did not have great skills as a writer. I think everything that he would have put down would have been 100% honest. I don't think he would have been like some of the others who, uh, you know, uh, stretched the truth or fabricated things or whatever. It just, it, it would not have been a very readable account. It would have been purely, I did X because of such and such, which don't get me wrong, would have been very helpful, but just not very readable. So we don't have Lee's side of things for the most part, but we do have things from his military family. Of course, uh, Lee would spend four years of his life largely away from his own family, from his wife, his kids, his brothers, his sisters, and uh, he, he really had to substitute in his military family, uh, primarily young men in their 20s and 30s who were attached to headquarters that got to know him very well. Um, not so much as a friend, Lee was not really open to that. Uh, uh, and there was also the age difference between them. But you know, when you work with someone, you get to know them. And that's how these, uh, these young men, these officers on his staff got to know Lee. They had insight to him that no one else did. And the uh, Shortly after Lee died in 1870, his, uh, his eldest son, Custis, who took over the presidency of Washington College, he asked one of those staff members, Charles Marshall, who you see right here on the screen, to write an essay 
about the general that was going to be in a, a short memorial publication that uh, Washington College was going to publish about Lee. And Marshall declined. He didn't think he had the, the time or, the, uh, uh, or could do Lee justice in the, the small amount of space in this publication. And uh, he told Custis that he, he wouldn't do it. So Custis found somebody else. Uh, but this ask really, uh, it was kind of the catalyst, if you will, uh, for Marshall thinking, well, you know, I do need to write down what it was like serving with Lee during the war. And uh, Marshall, uh, about a year after that, would write to that same cousin, Cassius Lee, who, who I quoted earlier, or the letter to him I quoted earlier, uh, where Lee was talking about his desire to write a history. This is what Charles Marshall told that same fellow. The author, the author should have access to the most authentic proof of all that he may state. He should have ample time to collect all facts and he should omit nothing that bears upon the subject. I had not then, nor have I now, the means of writing a more extensive work, though I'm using every means to prepare myself at some future time to do so. I am preparing a life of the general, which I hope to present within a year or 18 months, provided I can get the materials. If I can do no more, I shall collect all that I can and write all I know to be used by some future biographer. And that last sentence, uh, that Marshall knew what he was doing. Uh, Marshall realized the value of what he had up here, what that meant to future historians. And uh, unfortunately, like Lee, Marshall died before he completed this. But unlike Lee, he did manage to get a lot of his thoughts down on paper, but he never completed it. He wrote, he wrote kind of in chunks. He did a big chunk on Gettysburg. He did a big chunk on the early uh, part of the war and he did a big chunk on 1864, uh, but there were big gaps in what he had. Uh, but he did collect quite a bit of material and he wrote his own thoughts. So even though he did not uh, succeed in getting his final, uh, his finished uh, memorial to his former boss, he did succeed in his secondary goal, collecting everything that he could for future use. And I'll revisit that thought here in just a second. Well, these young guys at headquarters, their insight is invaluable. If you wanna know what it was like for Lee during the Civil War, if you wanna know what it was like at the headquarters of the Army of Northern Virginia, you have to turn to this handful uh, of guys, six or eight uh, young officers, and one of whom, really the most important of whom, uh, both in terms of Lee historiography, as well as most important in terms of keeping headquarters running, is this guy right here, Walter Taylor, late 20s uh, from Norfolk, Virginia. He's a banker. Uh, he's military educated, went to Norfolk Military Academy, as well as VMI. Uh, and he's also a member of the uh, militia unit there in Norfolk. So he comes from a very strong military background, but instead of pursuing that as a career, uh, he's a very sharp guy, he's good with numbers. So he went into banking and accounting, and uh, that would be his, his, uh, his main strength at, uh, at headquarters. In our small circle of personal staff, I can't see part of my uh, screen here. Bear with me for a second. Move this out of the way so I can read that quote. In our small circle of the personal staff, there was between General Lee and his military family, a degree of camaraderie that was perfectly delightful. Our conversation, especially at the table, was free from restraint, unreserved as between equals, and often of a bright and jocular vein. Lee was very fond of a joke and not infrequently indulged in the pastime of teasing those about him in a mild way. While it would never occur to any one of us to be otherwise than perfectly deferential in our manner toward him and respectful in our, in our deportment toward each other in his presence, there was an utter absence of the rigid formality and the irksome ceremony regarded by some as essential features of military etiquette appertaining to the station of the commander in chief of the army. So Taylor is saying, you know, yes, it, it was not, you know, what you would think. You know, you think of Napoleon or a lot of these other European generals, you know, with these huge staffs, you know, dozens and dozens of officers, you know, and there's a very clear divide. Lee didn't have that. His personal staff is normally five guys during the entire war, in addition to, to the army staff. And during his, uh, during his first time in the field in the uh, late summer and uh, fall of 1861, he and his two staff officers lived in the same tent. So he, there is this closeness here that you don't have with a lot of other officers. You know, you can't really picture George McClellan, you know, going out and, and uh, you know, sharing his accommodations with any of his staff officers. I mean, McClellan's a perfect example. You know, he had this guy, uh, a uh, uh, French prince on his staff. Uh, Lee wanted the minimal amount of staff. Uh, he wanted the, the available men in uniform. He wanted them serving in the ranks, not 
uh, doing useless jobs at headquarters. So it definitely overburdened his staff. They were not uh, too appreciative of that uh, particular approach uh, by Lee, but he, he kept things as, as minimal as possible at headquarters. Now, Taylor, when I mentioned how important he is in terms of the historiography of Lee, uh, without Walter Taylor, we would not know most of what Lee does during the war, at least in terms of the, the headquarters level. Uh, Taylor is with him for all but two weeks of the war. Lee uh, resigns in, uh, in uh, April, uh, I believe the 20th of uh, 1861. By the first week of May, Walter Taylor has been assigned to Lee as his assistant, and he will stay with him throughout the entire war. Uh, so Taylor is closer to this man than anybody else. Uh, even though there's this gap in age, that does kind of work out into kind of a father-son relationship here. Uh, now, Taylor... He's a very sharp young man, like I said. He loves to write. He will write letters at least once, usually twice, sometimes even three times a week to his girlfriend and later wife, Betty Saunders. Uh, so it's from these letters that we get this fantastic appreciation of what is going on with Lee, what's going on at headquarters. Only problem is, for whatever reason, she never said why, Betty destroyed his letters for the first year and a half of the war. So from uh, beginning of May, of 61 on up through about mid 1862, most of Taylor's letters don't survive. And uh, when he found out uh, in 1862 that she was destroying them, he, he pleaded with her, pled with her, pleaded with her. He asked her, whatever the word is, he asked her not to, uh, not to destroy them, to please save them. And he told her, I'm writing these not just for your benefit, I'm writing them for my benefit as well. This is the only place where I'm documenting my wartime service. I want these for myself on down the road. So from there on out, she didn't destroy them. But unfortunately, that was a bell that couldn't be unrung. Uh, so the, there's a huge gap uh, in, uh, in Taylor's uh, letters. Now, after the war, Taylor becomes very sought after because of his connections to Lee. Veterans groups, uh, they, they all want him to come speak to them. And everybody in the South is, is clamoring for him to write a book. You know, you were with this man night and day for four years. Please tell us what it was like. We, you had access that the rest of us can only dream about. Please tell us more about this. And so finally... Uh, in the mid-1870s, uh, Taylor will uh, publish a book called Four Years of General Lee. And don't let the uh, title fool you, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's a very numbers-driven history of the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, Taylor, being a banker, being a numbers guy, that's what he focused on. When morning reports got created in the field and were turned into headquarters, Taylor is the guy that processed it. If you want to know the strength of the Army in Northern Virginia at a particular battle or campaign during the war, you ask Taylor, he had this stuff up here. He could remember numbers, uh, you know, without even having to look them up. So that's what he wrote, was this numbers heavy uh, history of the campaigns of the Army in Northern Virginia. It there was very little, if any, personal memoir or anything that resembled the title, Four Years of General Lee. So it kind of flopped. It was not uh, very well received at all. And he continued to receive these requests, you know, that, please tell us, you know, we want to know what, what you can tell us. Uh, so finally, after several decades, he did. He published a second book called General Lee, His Campaigns in Virginia. He really got the title flip flop. This is what the first one should have been called. The second one should have been Four Years of Lee. But this is the one that really had the personal memoir. This is the one that offered up the insight about General Lee. And it's by far the better of the two. If you ever want to read a fantastic book that gives you insight into, into the subject, Read General Lee and his campaigns in Virginia, the, the second one of Taylor's books. It, it's fascinating, the, the detail that he has in there. And it's very easy to see that he's referring back to his letters. Uh, in some cases, it's almost verbatim from the letters that he sent to Betty. And speaking of his letters, most of them survive, except for the ones that Betty destroyed, including his post-war correspondence. The wartime portion of it was published back in the 90s. It's uh, uh, the University of South Carolina Press, I think, uh, published it. Um, and the, uh, the originals are at the, uh, the Norfolk Public Library, as well as copies at the uh, Virginia State Library in Richmond. Here again, it's a great read. The, the detail, the, the things that he noticed that other people wouldn't, the level of detail about headquarters is fascinating. Uh, and here again, without Walter Taylor, we would not know half of what we know about Lee during the war. But he's not the only one that, uh, that puts down on paper uh, the, about their time with their former boss. Uh, just about everybody that served on Lee's staff, be it long-term or short-term, short 
left some sort of account of that time period. It may have been something that was written for the public eye. It may be something not. It may be just their private correspondence, their personal letters, a diary uh, that exists in, a, in an archive somewhere. But all of these guys leave us some little glimpse, uh, even if it's just a tiny little nugget. They all have something they can contribute to this subject. One of the other big ones is Armistead Long. He was Lee's military secretary. He would join Lee in December of 61. He's with him through mid-63. Uh, so he offers up a, a lot of detail that we don't have from Taylor because of the destruction of his letters. Uh, Fitz Lee, the general's nephew, who would uh, rise to be uh, Jeb Stewart's replacement, commanding the cavalry in the Army in Northern Virginia. Uh, he wrote a biography of his uncle, came out in the 1890s. This would be when Fitz was at the height of his political career that was based solely on the fact that his last name was Lee and Jeb Stewart loved him. Uh, that was really fits his only campaign platform and to try and build his uh, popularity. He wrote this biography of his uncle. Um, Lee's youngest son, Rob Jr., he uh, wrote a, uh, it's a combination. It's a bit of a memoir and it also uh, publishes a lot of letters. And in this case, a lot of letters that the originals don't exist. We don't know what happened to them. Uh, and it's a great glimpse uh, at, uh, at uh, his father. And circling back to Charles Marshall here again, uh, you remember when I said that uh, he collected what he could to be used by a future historian? This is where that comes into play. And uh, also, I should mention about Marshall. You might not recognize his name or his face, but I can almost guarantee you that you're familiar with some of Marshall's work. Uh, Lee's farewell order at Appomattox, that wasn't written by Lee. That was written by Charles Marshall. Uh, Lee's campaign reports that are in the official records, not written by Lee. They were edited by Lee, but they were written by Charles Marshall. The uh, uh, Conscription Act that came about in April of, uh, of 1861 that really kept the army from disintegrating. That was written by Charles Marshall. Uh, Marshall was a lawyer. He was a very skilled writer. Lee put him to use. Uh, when he had these uh, limited men on his staff, he figured out what their strengths were and he used them to the utmost. In the case of Marshall, it was legal stuff and it was his writing skills. Uh, but anyway, getting back to uh, Marshall's contribution here, uh, he never finished his memoirs, like I mentioned. And in the uh, early 1920s, a biography of Lee uh, is published by a British general, uh, Sir Frederick Maurice. And it was very popular on both sides of the Atlantic. And one of the people that read it was Charles Marshall's daughter. And she got hold of Maurice, explained to him who she was and says, I have my father's incomplete memoirs and some of his papers, would you like to see them? Uh, now I can almost imagine Maurice's initial reaction to this, being a writer and a museum person it never fails. As soon as a book is published, people come out of the woodwork with sources that you would have loved to have had before it went to press. When you finish an exhibit, after the exhibit opens, that's when people come out of the woodwork with these great artifacts that you would have loved to have included. Uh, so I can sympathize with uh, the reaction that Maurice must have had here. Why didn't you tell me this sooner? Uh, but he reads uh, Marshall's papers and realizes the, the gold mine that his daughter has, has sent him, and he gets permission to, uh, to publish them. So he will edit them and uh, they will be published in 1927. And here again, Marshall offers up insight that nobody else did. And some of the other folks on his staff, I'm not gonna go into all of his staff officers here, but uh, uh, some of the others who leave us very valuable accounts, uh, Thomas Talcott, who was the son of uh, Lee's mentor, Andrew Talcott, when uh, Lee was straight out of West Point, young engineer lieutenant, uh, Andrew Talcott took Lee under his wing and uh, really taught him the ropes, both of engineering and of life in the army. So uh, Lee was kind of returning a favor here by uh, bringing uh, his mentor's son onto, uh, onto his staff for a time as an engineer aide. Uh, the guy in the middle, he was uh, Giles Cook. He served as an aide to uh, quite a few generals, including Bragg, Beauregard, and Lee. His diary uh, from uh, 1865 is a, a gold mine, especially when it comes to the Appomattox campaign uh, portion. And he also uh, liked to uh, make, he, he was big on the uh, uh, speaker circuit after the war. And then this other guy, Charles Venable. He's probably my favorite of all of Lee's aides. Uh, the man was an absolute genius. Uh, his IQ must have been off the charts. Uh, he graduated college at age 16. He was a college professor at age 17. Uh, he was a mathematical genius. The only problem was, like most folks that fit that mold, he couldn't really function in society, and he didn't have a filter. If something popped into his head, boom, it was coming out of his mouth, whether it should or not. And that served to get him in trouble quite a bit. 
with uh, with Lee because he just you know he didn't know when not to say something. Uh, but he was uh, very uh, valuable to Lee, and even though they butted heads quite often, I think Lee actually did appreciate uh, Venable's uh, uh, candor a lot of times, uh, even though, again, he was frequently in the doghouse. Um, Venable uh, would publish several articles in the uh, Southern Historical Society papers, I think it was, uh, or Century Magazine, maybe, uh, after the war. And uh, he also wrote his memoirs, but they never saw the light of day. Uh, that's the project that I'm working on currently is editing his, uh, his memoirs and his papers. Uh, he offers up stuff that nobody else commented on. I, I mentioned earlier about Lee ordering his staff to fire on his own men at Sharpsburg. Venable is the source for that. Venable is the source as well for Lee almost being killed at Second Manassas. He's the source for quite a few things that the other staff either didn't witness or didn't bother to record. And uh, he would be a professor at uh, University of Virginia for, for decades after the war. He was, a, he was a huge deal in Charlottesville before and after the war. And of course, Lee's own writings. And, uh, there are hundreds, probably thousands of pieces of Lee correspondence. Just about every uh, little small town historical society has at least one letter uh, uh, from Lee, be it wartime or not. Uh, but the, the best stuff, and it's really a good cross-section of personal correspondence and official correspondence, was published in this one volume uh, back during the uh, centennial back in the 60s. And uh, it's a, a good, like I say, a good cross-section of, of General Lee writing to Richmond or to his subordinates, as well as Lee the husband, Lee the father, Lee the family man, writing to, uh, to his family. Now... With that out of the way, we can jump into talking here about uh, some of the uh, more interesting incidents uh, that, regarding Lee during the war. And one thing uh, to keep in mind, when you're reading an account of a battle, uh, you know, if you're reading, you know, uh, Trudeau's history of Gettysburg, or, you know, uh, any kind of uh, battle uh, history, uh, most of it focuses just on the strategy, the tactics, the troop movements. It doesn't really focus on, on what's going on behind the scenes with these guys. And that's something that I really tried to do with this book. What's going on with Lee behind the scenes while the armies are in motion? You know, he didn't stop being a husband. He didn't stop being a father. Uh, he didn't stop being, uh, you know, uh, a friend to uh, a lot of folks during the war. A lot of this stuff was, was still happening you know, while there are shots being fired on the field, you know, his, his concerns are not limited just to what those guys in blue over across the way are doing. He's got all kinds of stuff weighing down uh, in the back of his mind throughout the entire war. And uh, some things to keep in mind about, uh, about that particular uh, subject, Lee will lose his home during the war. Uh, several of his relatives write him off. They don't approve of his decision uh, to resign from the army and uh, follow Virginia out of the Union. Uh, his wife uh, becomes crippled by rheumatoid arthritis during the war. Uh, he will lose one of his children. Uh, she will die here in North Carolina. He will lose both of his grandchildren. Uh, he will lose a daughter-in-law, whom in his mind was just a, another daughter. He loved uh, Charlotte as much as he did his own uh, flesh and blood daughters. And uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, his, uh, his own son was captured from his sickbed and hauled off to a prison camp up north and literally held hostage for the first uh, few weeks that he was uh, in custody. Uh, so not he's concerned not just with things on the battlefield. He's got, you know, uh, Jefferson Davis breathing down his neck in Richmond. So this man, he's the weight of responsibility on his shoulders is, is not always apparent when you're reading uh, campaign histories or, or battle studies is, is what I'm getting at here. Now, we know Lee uh, primarily as being the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia during the war. So that's what he was for most of the war. Excuse me. But uh, that's not the only uh, assignment that he has. He has several assignments prior to that in the 14 months before he takes command of what becomes the Army of Northern Virginia. His first assignment, he is the commander of Virginia's military. As soon as he goes out of the U.S. Army, that's what he does. He goes to Richmond. The uh, governor and the legislature appoint him as the Virginia's commander-in-chief. Uh, so this is a tremendous task. Yes, Virginia has uh, militia units. Yes, there is an overall militia commander, but these militia units are all over the map, both literally all over the state as, and also figuratively in terms of their uh, preparedness, their leadership. Uh, 
add to that these uh, tens of thousands of volunteers that are coming in. Uh, so he has to create an army out of this chaos, while at the same time, he has to fortify and defend Virginia. Virginia had never been a separate country. You know, now the Potomac is the border between two hostile countries. He has to fortify the Potomac. He has to fortify the uh, rivers in the eastern part of the state, the uh, uh, approaches towards the interior of the state. He has to figure out some kind of defensive strategy for the mountains out in the west. And he's working 10, 12, 14 hour days at his desk in Richmond. Uh, he's constantly meeting with the governor, with other elected officials, with the governor's military advisor, Francis Smith, who is the superintendent of VMI. He's got office seekers coming in. He, you know, the, the amount of paperwork and the amount of meetings he's in for these first few weeks of the war is just astronomical. It, it's a wonder the man didn't collapse under the pressure then. Um, and uh, he commented very little on it other than to comment on or other than to say how busy he was, that he did not have time for anything that wasn't work-related at that point. Uh, however, he does get out into the field three times during his uh, tenure as commander of Virginia's forces. In the middle of May, he will go down the James to Norfolk. He takes Francis Smith uh, with him. They will spend three days inspecting the uh, troops and fortifications uh, in and around Norfolk and Portsmouth. And then he goes back to Richmond. Uh, at the end of the month, he goes to Northern Virginia to inspect the troops and positions around Manassas. And then about a week later, he goes back down the James, but on the other side, uh, going to uh, Jamestown Island, Williamsburg, and Yorktown to inspect the uh, fortifications and troops there. And on all three of these visits, did not like what he found. All three of them resulted in change of commanders. Uh, they were all uh, previously under the command of just the senior militia officer, present. Well, he, he did away with that. He brought in people that he knew, at least by reputation, and uh, uh, folks that he could trust. Uh, Beauregard is the prime example. He was given command in Northern Virginia. Uh, John Magruder turned out to be eh, maybe not the best choice uh, for command down on the peninsula. And uh, uh, Benjamin Huger, here again, probably not the best choice, but Lee thought highly of him uh, before the war, given command in Norfolk. Got ahead of myself. He, uh, Around the end of July, uh, Lee will be uh, reassigned. Uh, things were not going very well uh, thus far the first few months here for uh, Virginia, for, well, what is now uh, Confederate forces in the uh, mountains of Western Virginia, what is now West Virginia. Uh, so Lee was sent out there uh, to try and work his magic there. And uh, he will take two officers with him. One of them, you can probably guess, Walter Taylor, and the other is this guy. Colonel John Augustine Washington III. Uh, Washington was the great grandnephew of George Washington, and he was the last owner of Mount Vernon. Uh, it was John Washington, in fact, who sold Mount Vernon to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1858, 59, whenever that uh, was finalized. Uh, so it's in largely in, uh, in uh, because of John Washington that uh, the Mount Vernon. Uh, still exists today in the, in the uh, fashion that it does. Um, Lee and Washington were distantly related. Um, they knew each other, uh, both being from prominent uh, Northern Virginia families, and uh, Washington was assigned to Lee's staff shortly after uh, Taylor was. Uh, and Lee was closer to John Washington than he was anybody else in the staff. They were much closer in age. Uh, like I say, they came from the same uh, social circles as well as the same geographic region, as well as being distantly related. Uh, but they just, they, they connected on a level that Lee did not connect with, uh, with anybody else. Uh, Lee himself was very strongly religious. Washington was even more so. Uh, Lee remarked in one letter, uh, that Washington, you know, I, I wish I could be as pious as Washington. So it, it makes you wonder, you know, just exactly how uh, deeply devoted was Washington, you know, that would, that would cause somebody like Lee uh, to make that remark. Uh, but Lee goes out there uh, into the mountains of West Virginia at the end of July, and uh, the weather is uh, his enemy more so really than the federal army. Uh, he's out there from the end of July until just before October. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, the time span of several months, it rained or snowed all of about 10 or 12 of those days that he was out there. Uh, so moving in that type of terrain, it was just impossible. The, the valleys were flooded, the roads that were farther up the mountainsides, they were getting washed out by the rain. He had, there, there was no chance that he was going to be able 
uh, to move an army out there. He was having a hard enough time keeping his army supplied in camp, let alone trying to move them out of camp along these uh, flooded and washed out roads. Uh, so he, he's behind the eight ball here, so to speak, to begin with. Uh, he finally uh, decides that uh, the weather has cleared up enough and he thinks he's found a, a weak spot in the Union lines out there at a place called uh, Cheat Mountain. So he uh, brings all of his forces together uh, with this very complicated and convoluted battle plan. Uh, he should have known better, honestly, uh, than to try and do this. He had some troops at the top of a mountain, some down here at the bottom of a mountain. They couldn't see each other. Communication between the two of uh, all the various components was practically non-existent. Uh, so it should come as no surprise that this uh, campaign really fizzled into nothing. Uh, the commander who was supposed to launch the attack took one look at the Union position and said, nope, I'm not attacking that. He was the first domino, and when that didn't fall, Nothing else uh, happened either. Uh, so the next day, Lee is trying to, to scramble to salvage something out of his campaign, and he sends Washington out on a reconnaissance. Normally, Lee did his own recon. Up for the first two years or so, maybe two and a half years of the war, Lee does his own reconnaissance. He doesn't depend on his staff to do this. He had made a name for himself in Mexico, going out there and being the eyes of Winfield Scott and the, uh, the American army in Mexico. So he was continuing that. It's, it's what he knew, it's what he was uh, comfortable doing. Uh, but for whatever reason, he sends Washington out in his stead on September 13th. And he sends uh, Rooney, his, uh, his son, along with him. Rooney was the uh, commander of uh, the cavalry out there in, the, in that region. And uh, the two of them with a couple of uh, uh, troopers along as an escort, uh, they ride into an ambush. Uh, the end result of which Washington is killed. He's shot multiple times. I think the final count was eight bullet holes were found in his body. He was dead before he even hit the ground. Uh, Rooney's horse is killed out from under him. Rooney manages to very quickly get on uh, Washington's horse and just barely escape before he's killed or captured. And he goes back to, uh, to headquarters to tell his father what had happened. And um, without getting into too much detail, I don't want to spend an hour bogged down just on this one episode, but uh, Washington's death uh, was unquestionably the day that the war hit home for Lee, September 13th, 1861. Uh, Lee writes three letters as soon as Rooney gets back and tells him what has happened, one of, whom, one of which is to uh, Washington's daughter. And I've read hundreds of letters written by Lee. And I can tell you, this letter to Louisa Washington, it's unique. I've never seen the man display the range of emotion that he does in this letter, he's all over the place. I mean, it's almost like you can see the tear stains on the paper. He's so distraught by the loss of his friend and it, his emotions in this letter, it goes back and forth from despair to anger. He, when, he, uh, when Washington's body was returned, he was furious. He said they, they shouldn't have shot him that many times. Uh, he was furious, you know, so he, there's anger at the enemy. And like I say, you, you can tell, this is when it really clicked for him. We're really at war. This, this is when, it hit home for him. And uh, if you want to know more about this, ask me afterwards. This is a very uh, touching story that there's a lot more to, but I don't want to uh, spend more time on it here. But here's an excerpt of what the uh, letter that he had to, or that he sent uh, to Louisa. This is not the whole thing. This is just a portion. With a heart filled with grief, I have to communicate the saddest tidings you have ever heard. Your dear father in reconnoitering the enemy's position yesterday came within the range of fire of their pickets and was instantly killed. He fell in the cause to which he had devoted all his energies and in which his noble heart was enlisted. My intimate association with him for some months has more fully disclosed to me his great worth than double as many years of ordinary intercourse would have been sufficient to reveal. We had shared the same tent and morning and evening as his earnest devotion to Almighty God elicited my grateful admiration. These three guys, Lee, Washington, and Taylor, they were all living in the same tent. It was their living quarters, it was their office quarters. They got to know each other very well uh, during these uh, uh, several weeks out there in West Virginia. And every morning and every evening, Washington led the three of them in, uh, in prayer, uh, morning and evening. Uh, so the, the, there's a closeness between these three. And, and Taylor's accounts of Washington's death are equally as touching. Uh, the loss of Washington, it, it really struck a chord for both men. I bring up my text again. Around Halloween, shortly before Halloween, Lee will get recalled back to Richmond. Uh, he was not able to, to do much in West Virginia. In fact, his, he was regarded in the press as, as a failure by this point. His, uh, his stock is, is rapidly falling in the, in the public's eyes. Uh, so Davis recalls him back to Richmond 
but he thinks he's going to be going back behind his desk. That's not what Davis has in mind. Uh, Davis is sending him south to uh, South Carolina, Georgia. He's going to put him in charge of the uh, defenses along the South Atlantic coast, along uh, South Carolina, Georgia, northern part of Florida. Um, Charleston, by that point, is pretty well taken care of. So Lee really focuses on Savannah and northern Florida. And on uh, one of his trips down to Florida, he's coming back up, uh, back up the coast, and uh, he realizes that he's near his father's gravesite. Uh, now, Light Horse Harry Lee is a Revolutionary War hero. He was a cavalry commander. Uh, he was a true war hero of the American Revolution. Uh, that very quickly reverses itself in the War of 1812. Uh, for whatever reason, Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee was, was adamantly anti-war with England, which was the wrong sentiment to have at that time. And uh, he was attacked and very nearly killed by an angry mob in Baltimore as a result of his, uh, of his views on the war. And uh, so he goes into self-exposed or self-imposed exile down in the West Indies. And when he was getting uh, toward what he knew to be the end of his life, he wanted to come back to Virginia and say his goodbyes, but he never made it. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he made the ship put in in Georgia, a place called Dungeness, which was the uh, uh, family home of uh, General Green. And he had hoped to be nursed back to health there. Didn't happen. He died there and was buried there. And uh, even though Lee was stationed not far from there, straight out of West Point, never went to visit his father's grave. He doesn't go until sometime in January of 1862. So we're talking, you know, decades after his father's grave, uh, after his father's death, he finally gets around to going to visit it. We don't know the exact date. Lee did not record the date that he went. In fact, he only mentions it in passing in two letters, one to uh, his wife, Mary, and one to, I believe, Mildred, his daughter. Uh, this is what he said to Mary. While at Fernandina, I went over to Cumberland Island and walked up to Dungeness, the former residence of General Green. It was my first visit to the house, and I had the gratification at length of visiting my father's grave. He died there, you may recollect, on his way from the West Indies and was interred in one corner of the family cemetery. The spot is marked by a plain marble slab with his name, age, and date of death. That's all he had to say about it. He spent the rest of this letter talking about family uh, news and describing the remains of this mansion. Uh, so you would think this would be an emotional thing for Lee seeing his father's grave. It wasn't. It was almost an afterthought. Uh, it, he just he was not close with his father. His father left while Lee was still uh, young, so they, they really did not know each other. There was no connection there. And uh, unfortunately, we don't even know what day Lee goes over there to visit his grave. Light Horse Harry would uh, eventually be reinterred in Lexington uh, at WNL. At the beginning of March, Lee is called back to Richmond. Uh, he thinks, and just about everybody thinks, that Lee is going to be the new Secretary of War. Uh, but that is not what uh, Jefferson Davis has in mind for him. Uh, he is going to be the new military advisor to the president. Um, if there's ever been a president uh, that did not want or need a military advisor, it's Jefferson Davis. Uh, he's a West Pointer. He commanded a regiment during the Mexican War. He was former Secretary of War himself. He thinks he's a military genius. Eh, there, there might be something to that. Uh, he's definitely not the, the best, but he, he knew what he was doing militarily. He doesn't want a military advisor, but Congress really forced this on him, and uh, he decided this would be a good post for Lee. And uh, so Lee is, is put into this really thankless and almost invisible position uh, where the public doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, Lee himself barely knows what his responsibilities are. Um, Davis doesn't even know what his responsibilities are. It's basically whatever Davis lets him do. And this is what he explained to, yet again, Cassius Lee, uh, in a letter shortly after he gets to Richmond. I had been called here very unexpectedly to me and have been placed on duty at this place under the direction of the president. I'm willing to do anything I can to help the noble cause we are engaged in and to take any position but the lower and more humble the position, the more agreeable to me and the better qualified I should feel to fill it. I fear I shall be able to do little in the position assigned me and cannot hope to satisfy the feverish and excited expectation of our good people. And so Lee develops a rapport and a trust with Jefferson Davis that, that really works out to their advantage. Neither one of them wanted this position. Neither one of them knew what to do with this position, but they both managed to make the best out of it. Lee... Davis really leaves Lee alone to, to do his own thing. And so Lee is the one who's really moving the pieces on the chessboard, if you will, in the spring of 1862. His primary focus, of course, is on Virginia. That's where he is. But he's also looking all over the map. He's 
still worried about things in Charleston and Savannah back in his old department. He's worrying about New Orleans. He's worried about things along the upper Mississippi. He's worried about Tennessee. So he, his, his mind is all over the place at this point. And really the biggest thing to come out of uh, his time period here, well, two things really, the, the Conscription Act, which keeps the Confederate Army from melting away when the initial one year enlistments uh, run out. And uh, that was, uh, he told uh, Charles Marshall to, to draft something up and Marshall did. And also the other biggest thing that he does, he's the one who green lights uh, Stonewall Jackson in Shenandoah Valley here in, uh, in 62. Uh, Joe Johnston had told Jackson no. Lee pulled rank on him and said, go ahead. And that uh, Johnston was not too happy with Lee for that for a little while uh, thereafter. But uh, Lee will uh, only be in that position for a few months. Uh, the scene of, uh, of, uh, of action in Virginia has been moved to Richmond, to the very outskirts of Richmond. Uh, George McClellan's Army of the Potomac has pushed Joe Johnston back to the very eastern and northern outskirts of the capital. And uh, Johnston, he's very secretive. This was part of his downfall with uh, President Davis was that he wouldn't tell Davis Lee or anybody else what the plans were. Um, so Lee learned some things from seeing how Johnston uh, and Davis functioned. But uh, Johnston will launch an offensive uh, at the end of May. And the only thing that really comes out of it, Johnston gets himself wounded severely and is out of action for months. And uh, Davis decides to put Lee in temporary command of the Army in Northern Virginia. Temporary, mind you. This is not supposed to be permanent. This is just temporary until David, until uh, Johnston rather recovers. Um, after four weeks, Lee will launch his own offensive, pushes McClellan away from the Capitol, has McClellan on his heels. McClellan will eventually settle down at Berkeley Plantation and uh, lick his wounds for a while. So much so that Lee seizes the initiative and launches his own campaign. Uh, the scene of battle shifts from the Richmond vicinity back to Northern Virginia. There's a new army, Army of Virginia, under a guy called John Pope. Lee hated John Pope. He respected all the rest of the commanders he was up against. He, McClellan and Meade, he had the utmost respect for. Burnside, he knew he wasn't the sharpest tack in the box, but he, he, everybody that knew Ambrose Burnside liked him. He was just that kind of guy. Uh, he couldn't stand Joe Hooker, but he respected his military abilities. Grant, he respected his abilities. John Pope, Lee couldn't stand the man personally. He thought he had no clue what he was doing as a general either. Lee, if he had his way, would have had Pope tried as a war criminal. Uh, he referred to him as a miscreant uh, several times. And uh, he, he wanted him not just defeated, but suppressed. And he was very upset that one of his cousins was serving on, uh, on Pope's personal staff. But anyway, Lee will unloosh first Stonewall Jackson on, uh, on Pope, and then he will bring up a good chunk of the rest of the army, Longstreet's wing of the army up to Northern Virginia to, uh, to take on Pope. Lee has a couple close calls. Uh, luck will be on his side for the first two of these. Uh, somewhere around Thoroughfare Gap, he is way out in advance of the troops. There's no cavalry screen, no nothing in front of him. It's just him and the, the staff marching along the road uh, through potentially enemy territory. And maybe from here, probably not even over to the river, a uh, Union cavalry patrol appears on a ridge right in front of them. Immediately, the, the staff panic. They uh, deploy out the line in front of Lee. They send Lee scrambling to the rear. And uh, they're, they're worried that they're all going to be captured or killed. But the commander of this Union detachment, for whatever reason, uh, decided not to attack. He obviously didn't know what was in front of him. Can't blame him for that. Uh, but instead of even moving forward to explore, he just turned around and went back into the woods where he came from. Uh, so Lee had a very close call there. Then when he actually gets to the battlefield there at Manassas, here again, he's gonna do his own personal recon. Uh, he leaves the rest of the staff back behind the woods. He gets down off his horse, moves forward on foot to the edge of the woods and very nearly gets himself killed. Uh, he was trying to remain unseen, but at least one federal soldier out there across the field saw him and fired a shot in his direction. And it actually left a trail along his cheek. Uh, Charles Venable recorded this. On reaching the field at Jackson's fight of the 28th, Lee ordered his staff to remain at the edge of the woods out of sight of the enemy while he went forward on foot to Jackson's skirmish line and made his own observation. On his return to the edge of the woods, he swiftly remarked, a sharpshooter came near killing me just now. We saw how near it was as his cheek had been grazed by the bullet of a sharpshooter. So he's you know, within a fraction of an inch, you know, almost killed here at 2nd uh, Manassas at the end of August. 
Uh, second Manassas would go on to be one of his biggest victories. Uh, Longstreet drives Pope off the field in confusion. But then the following day, uh, Lee's luck runs out. Uh, somehow or another, he manages to break one wrist and sprain the other. There's 14 known accounts of this. None of them agree on how it happened, where it happened, when it happened. The only thing they agree upon is that Lee's horse, Traveler, was somehow involved. Uh, one of them says uh, Traveler threw him. Another says that Traveler fell on him. One says he was holding the reins and Traveler pulled him down. Whatever it was, Traveler somehow uh, knocked Lee down and damaged both of his wrists. So much so, he has to have them both put in slings. He can't write, can't dress himself, can't even feed himself. Uh, so he is confined like this, he can't ride a horse, can't do anything for himself for several weeks. When the army crosses the, uh, crosses the Potomac into Maryland and, and what becomes the uh, Sharpsburg campaign, he's confined to the back of an ambulance, having to have uh, one of his aides feed him and dress him. Not the most distinguished entrance for the uh, commander of the army. It would not be until the end of October that he fully regains uh, the use of both hands. Um, what's next? Oh, uh, he would uh, go on to, uh, to Sharpsburg. Uh, he had just been able to, uh, to remount a horse about a day or two before that. Uh, he flirts with disaster there at uh, Sharpsburg so much so that, uh, as I've alluded to, uh, he uh, tells his staff, fire on those men if they don't stop and rally. It's in reference to, I believe, uh, James Kemper's brigade over on the right. Um, there's no indication that they actually did so. But that's the only time that I've ever found that Lee gave orders for that to happen, which is why Venable noted it is, because it was so out of character for Lee. Even in the, the hard spots of 1864, Lee never again gave those orders. This is, as far as known, the only time he ever gave those orders. After Sharpsburg, the uh, army will pull back into the northern Shenandoah Valley to uh, rest and refit. It had been very roughly handled north of the Potomac. And it's while he's there in October that he gets the uh, news out of the blue that uh, his uh, daughter Annie had died down here in North Carolina. She and uh, her mother and one of her sisters uh, uh, were over in uh, uh, Warren County. And uh, Annie suffered a, a very sudden onset of uh, uh, typhoid, I think it was, and, uh, killed her. And uh, the first that uh, he knew of her illness is when he was told that uh, she was dead. Walter Taylor was an accidental witness to uh, Lee receiving this news. One morning, the mail was received and the private letters were distributed as was the custom, but no one knew whether any home news had been received by the general. At the usual hour, he summoned me to his presence to know if there were any matters of army routine upon which his judgment and action were desired. The papers containing a few such cases were presented to him. He reviewed and gave his orders in regard to them. I then left, but for some cause returned in a few minutes, and with my accustomed freedom, I entered his tent without announcement, when I was startled and shocked to see Lee overcome with grief an open letter in his hands. That letter contained the sad intelligence of his daughter's death. And this is one of the few times where Taylor actually got to see not Lee the general, but Lee the father. And had Taylor not gone back in there for whatever reason, we would not, uh, we would not have this little tidbit. He was the only witness uh, to Lee uh, receiving this news. And just a few weeks thereafter, uh, disaster strikes again for Lee personally. His, uh, his second grandchild uh, died, Charlotte Carter Lee. This was uh, Rooney and Charlotte's uh, child uh, died unexpectedly. She was not even two months old. Uh, Rooney's first child, a uh, son who was about, I think, three or four years old, had died uh, during a seven days campaign uh, back around Richmond. Uh, Lee was not able to attend the, uh, the funeral for either one of them. Um, this is the uh, letter of condolence that, uh, that he sent to Charlotte. In the interest of time, I will skip over reading you that. Uh, but uh, Somebody asked me once, uh, who did Lee vent to the most when he really needed to vent? You know, when something was really on his mind and, and for whatever reason, you know, it, it just wasn't politic or, or appropriate to vent to the staff. Who did he vent to? He vented to his oldest son, Custis. He really looked to Custis to handle a lot of things because, because Lee has his, his hands full running the army. Uh, he looked to Custis to handle most of the family business. He wanted Custis to look after his mother, to look after uh, uh, his sisters, 
as well as take care of family business. One of the things that are uh, probably the biggest thing that, uh, that Lee passed off to Custis was the, uh, the manumission of the slaves that he inherited from his wife's uh, uh, family. Uh, the terms of his father-in-law's will was that they had to be set free X number of years after his death. And that timeline was rapidly approaching. The, the deadline, I think, was uh, uh, the end of 1862. And Lee handed that off uh, to Custis. Uh, but he also wanted Custis to, uh, to take care of Mary. And uh, whenever uh, Lee needed to vent about Congress or something like that, it, he would do it to Custis, uh, whether Custis was there at headquarters or not. And this is not to say that Custis didn't have his own life. He is Jefferson Davis's top aide for most of the war. So, you know, he's got his own uh, uh, plate full of things to deal with here, you know, and his father is dumping all kinds of other stuff in his lap. Uh, Custis would actually, towards the end of the war, wind up being heavily involved in the uh, Confederate uh, Secret Service, a lot of the clandestine stuff that was going on. Uh, but uh, he would frequently complain to Custis, uh, and it usually followed uh, a trip to Richmond and meeting with either Davis or uh, the Secretary of War or Congress, and uh, just how out of touch the politicians in Richmond, and in some cases, the, uh, the civilians uh, in Richmond and elsewhere were with the war effort. This is just one example of it here. Uh, this is from the beginning of 1863. Every exertion should be made to put the army on the strongest footing for vigorous work in the spring. Our salvation will depend on the next four months, and yet I cannot even get regular promotions made to fill vacancies in regiments, while Congress seems to be laboring to pass laws to get easy places for favorites or some other constituent, or get others out of active service entirely. I shall feel very much obliged to them if they will pass a law relieving me from all duty and legislating someone in my place better able to do it. And in 1864, he, he really kicked it up a notch with complaining about uh, Congress. There's one letter where he says, I've just gotten back from Richmond and Congress is more concerned with eating peanuts than they are with feeding my army. Uh, so without Custis, uh, who knows who he would have had to, uh, to vent his spleen to. And then there's the issue of his wife. Mary Custis, uh, she's basically a spoiled brat. Uh, she was uh, very, she was used to, to being, she was used to being rich. Uh, she couldn't adapt to, to not being in Arlington for starters. And she couldn't adapt to the fact that there's a war on and that there was a shortage of just about everything in the Confederacy, especially food. And uh, she would constantly write to Lee complaining, well, I've written you three letters. Why haven't you answered? There's a war on. I'm running an army. I don't have time. I'll write to you when I can. And it, you can see his frustration with her mounting throughout the war as she continually complains about the, the length of time between his letters. Uh, and at one point, um, he, would, he really lost it with her. At one point, they were living in, uh, uh, I believe, Bedford County, Virginia at the time. This would be sometime 63, 64 time frame. Uh, Lee had his own army on reduced rations. And he found out that Mary was drawing rations for herself and their daughters from the local army quartermaster depot. While at the same time, this is why Lee is complaining to Richmond, I can't get enough food for my army. Then he finds out that his wife is taking the limited rations that there are available for her own use. Uh, he lost it at that point. And she continued to just cause him a, a lot of unnecessary stress during the war. After she left Arlington, she never settled down anywhere. She would not put down roots. Lee wanted her to come to Raleigh because he thought that was safely behind the lines and the war would never get to Raleigh. Well, she didn't want to do that because she didn't know anybody. So she moves from relative to relative to friend to friend, bouncing all around Virginia, North Carolina, and, and in some cases, uh, almost into, into West Virginia. And she never settled down. At one point, she was behind Union lines, and McClellan had to specifically send her through, through, the, uh, through the lines in uh, June of 62. Uh, and it, it just caused Lee stress. That's one of the things he wanted Custis to take care of, telling her, you know, your mother won't listen to me. Maybe she'll listen to you. Go get her to... to settle down somewhere. She wouldn't do it. And as one more example of her stubbornness, she lost the ability to walk during the war because her arthritis got so bad. She was confined to a wheelchair. And at one point, a uh, doctor told her, you cannot get up out of this chair. You know, you cannot walk anymore. And she says, oh, I'm not doing that. And she's staying at this place in uh, Fluvanna County. And she tells, I forget which one of the girls was with her at the time, probably Agnes, uh, go bring me my crutches. I'm getting out of this chair. So she gets up out of the wheelchair and 
her crutches slip on the floor. Down she goes. And judging by the description, it sounds like she broke her hip. So, you know, here again, when uh, Lee finds out about this, you know, he, he's worried about, you know, the doctor told you, you can't do that. Why are you doing this type of thing? So, I mean, she was just adding to his stress level that he did not need. All of this finally builds up to Lee having what's probably a heart attack in uh, the end of April, or excuse me, the end of March of 1863. Uh, the army is camped outside of Fredericksburg at this point. Uh, it's hard to tell, you know, 150 whatever years after the fact, but it, it, it seems that it was a heart attack because it, it really knocked him flat. Uh, and he was confined to a bed for about two and a half, three weeks uh, in this home right here. It's no longer there. It burned down back in the 20s or 30s. It was called Belvoir. Um, and uh, that did not become army headquarters. He was there by himself. He took one of the uh, uh, two slaves that he had at headquarters with him. I forget whether it was uh, Meredith or Perry uh, went there with him, but the, the staff stayed at army headquarters. The doctor told him, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, Jackson can run the army right now, sir. You need to get well. You focus on your own health first. And uh, it started out, uh, the guy over there on the left, Dr. Lafayette Guild, he was the chief surgeon of the Army of Northern Virginia. He started out taking care of Lee, then he fell ill with something and his assistant over here, Dr. Bemis, took over. Uh, Taylor or Marshall would come over once or twice a day to keep Lee informed, but he was not dealing with the Army. Jackson was running the Army during this time period. And uh, it's interesting, uh, one of the big what ifs, you know, what if Hooker had moved, you know, a couple of weeks earlier, you know, while, uh, uh, while Lee was incapacitated here, what, uh, what would have happened? And he never really recovers from this. Up until this point in the war, as I mentioned, he'd been doing his own personal recon. That stops after this point. He, if Lee mentions in a letter that he doesn't feel well, something's wrong. Uh, he always tried to downplay for his wife and his kids uh, his own health. So it, it, when he mentions that he doesn't feel well, he doesn't feel well. And from here on out for the rest of the war, several times he would tell Mary, I've never recovered from my, my attack, is what he called it, of, uh, of the uh, spring of 1863. Never again would he do personal recon. From here on out, he had to depend on his staff or his lieutenants to be his own eyes, and that, that really crippled him uh, in the battlefield. I won't read this uh, entire letter to you, but I'll tell you the, uh, the gist of it. Uh, after Gettysburg, uh, Lee submits his resignation. Uh, Jefferson Davis has the uh, good sense not to accept it, but uh, the, the two reasons that Lee cited his failing health and two, he believed that he no longer had the, uh, the, the trust of the men in the army or the public at large. Uh, this is just a, an excerpt of that letter. Uh, but this one, it's, it's very different from every other letter that he ever wrote to Jefferson Davis. Uh, I have no doubt that he wrote it, but just the tone of it, I think he wrote this so that it could be published in a newspaper if Davis actually accepted his resignation because the public's going to want to know why. The, uh, their most successful general had just been removed from command. I think he uh, wanted this to be suitable for publication. The Army will go into uh, winter quarters in Orange County uh, for the winter of 63-64. Lee himself will stay in a tent uh, for the entire winter. Probably not the best choice given his health, but he, throughout the war, he very seldom stayed inside. Uh, normally, he wanted to be outside uh, under canvas, and that's what he does throughout this entire winter. He was just out of frame on the slope of that mountain over there, uh, just out of frame on the left. Uh, Orange Courthouse is just uh, uh, about a mile or so off in the distance behind Jefferson Davis there. Uh, but Davis comes to visit the Army in uh, November, uh, coming out there to, to try and boost morale. Morale was indeed sagging at this point. And uh, Davis comes out there. The plan is for him to review the Army, give uh, some speeches uh, to the troops, you know, just get everybody pumped up, you know, and tell them, you know, things aren't as bad, you know, as they look right now, because uh, this would be at the same time that uh, Bragg is about to lose Chattanooga here. So things are, are really, you know, down, you know, morale is bad at this point. Uh, so he comes out there, he stays in this house. Uh, it's called Bloomsbury. It's one of the oldest houses in, the, in Orange County. Um, it's on the grounds of the Orange County Airport. So if you have a private plane and fly into Orange County, you're going to land right in the front yard of this house. But um, Lee himself is uh, probably uh, about a half mile, three quarter of a mile distant. Uh, he would come over and uh, get Davis from this house every morning, uh, but it rained the whole time. So uh, Davis never got to do the review, never got to give the speeches that he wanted. Uh, he barely even got to see the federal army. At one point, there was a brief uh, break in the weather. Uh, Lee and Davis went up to the signal station on top of Clark's Mountain. Well, I couldn't see much because of the clouds, but uh, 
Uh, Davis wanted to see the enemy. You know, he, he liked being at the front. Throughout the Seven Days Campaign, uh, he would be at the front several times. In 1864, he would ride out to the, some of the fighting outside of Richmond. He, there was that uh, military instinct in him. He wanted to be there uh, to command troops in the field. But right after uh, Davis leaves, uh, Meade goes on the offensive. So he just missed his chance uh, to be there. The, uh, the mine run campaign would occupy the, uh, the last week of November, which turned into a, a big nothing. Uh, and so Lee will come back here to Orange for the winter. He goes to Richmond uh, just before Christmas in uh, about mid-December, 63. The reason, the Army of Tennessee needs a new commander. Bragg has lost Chattanooga. Bragg has lost the trust of just about everyone in his army as well as the public. Davis realizes he needs a new commander. And so he wants Lee to be that new commander. Lee wants no part of this, uh, but Lee is so convinced that he will be going to uh, going west that he tells Jefferson Davis on his way out of Orange, I'm not coming back. But this is one of those times where the, the Lee Davis relationship, we'd love to know what went on behind closed doors. Neither one of them left an account of this, but somehow or another, over the span of uh, a conference lasting literally a week, Lee somehow talks Davis out of sending him to take command of the Army of Tennessee. Not only does he do that, he talks Davis into putting Joe Johnston in command of the Army of Tennessee. Davis hates Johnston more than he hates anything else on the planet. So this is one of those instances where Lee worked some magic and nobody knows what was said to, to affect it. But uh, when that conference is over, Lee does indeed go back to Orange. He leaves. Uh, leaves Richmond on, I think, about the 22nd of December, and uh, almost immediately wished that he had not, uh, because he goes back. He wanted to spend Christmas the same way that the troops in his army did. He could have stayed in Richmond. Mary and the kids were actually in Richmond at this time. He could have been with his family. Nope, went back to Orange, wanted to spend it with, uh, with the troops in the field. And uh, as soon as he got there, he got word from Richmond that Rooney's wife, uh, Charlotte, had fallen ill. Uh, I left Richmond with a sad heart. Charlotte, who was so well on my arrival, looking like herself again, so cheerful, affectionate, and sweet, was taken sick two or three days before my departure and completely prostrated. The change between my arrival and my departure was so sudden and unexpected to me that I am filled with sadness and I can do nothing. And she would die the day after Christmas. And Lee never got, he never went back to Richmond. He never got to see her again. And he mentions that uh, uh, she was looking like herself again. That's because, uh, the, the death of her second child uh, had, had really hit her hard. She was probably suffering uh, initially from postpartum depression, and then the, the, the death of that child did nothing to, to help that. But also, Rooney had been wounded in uh, June 63 at Brandy Station, and he had been taken back to her home in Hanover County to recuperate. While Lee is on his way to Gettysburg, Yankee Cavalry comes up from Yorktown raids into Hanover County, finds out that Rooney is there. They raid that estate, literally pull him out of his sick bed, throw him in the back of a wagon and send him off to prison camp. So she was, Charlotte was falling apart mentally by this point. So that, that's, that's what he's referring to here uh, regarding her, uh, uh, her emotional state. Rooney may not have known that she died until he was exchanged in March. I have not found anything that indicates that uh, anybody that any letters got through to him while he was still in prison, uh, uh, notifying him of his wife's death. So how's that for a, a welcome back from prison camp? Um, anyway, uh, skipping ahead here to the Overland campaign. Uh, of course, Lee will try to lead troops on several occasions at the Wilderness and at Spotsylvania. Uh, he's up against yet another new opponent, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, Lee will have one chance, one chance to really stop Grant and reverse the reverse the tide here of the Overland campaign, and that is at the North Anna River uh, here towards the, the latter part of May of 64. Um, as his troops are taking position along the North Anna River, Lee is in the process of setting up a trap. And this house right here, Ellington, who's home to the Fox family, it's on a high bluff overlooking the river. Excellent observation point. There weren't as many trees around it in 1864 as there are today. Um, Lee rides up there to the house to, to watch the Union troops as they're approaching across the river. And the, uh, the owner of the house, Mr. Fox, uh, sees the officers out here in his front yard. He comes to the door, recognizes Lee. Oh, I need to do something. And uh, he goes down, invites Lee into the house. Uh, oh, General, I'd, I'd love it if you come in uh, for, for a meal. Uh, Lee tells him, oh, thank you, sir. No time for that. Lee was always the inveterate uh, 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 gentleman. Uh, so he 
begged off very graciously, uh, but in the process, he managed to hurt Fox's feelings. And he could, he could see that. And so he, uh, Lee reconsidered and said, well, I can't come in the house, but if you have some buttermilk for me and my men, I would love it. That was Lee's favorite drink. He wouldn't touch alcohol, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't drink much of anything except for water, buttermilk. He loved buttermilk. So Fox goes back into the house, comes out with the uh, uh, pitcher of buttermilk and some bread uh, for Lee and the, uh, the senior officers there. And uh, Lee goes up on the porch and uh, right about that time, uh, Union artillery deploys north of the river. They most likely did not know who their target was, but they saw this gaggle of officers out here, sent a couple of uh, artillery shots downrange. One of them passes within a few feet of Lee's head, slams into the uh, door frame right there at, uh, at Ellington, failed to explode. So yet another uh, close call here for Lee. But he has nearly, he has another close call here at, at Ellington as well. This is one of those things here again, 150 years later, I can't prove it. I think he comes down with food poisoning from this buttermilk because he was fine that morning, that afternoon, he's doubled over in pain with some kind of stomach ailment and it knocks him flat for the next several days. It gets so bad to the point where he can't go about, he's being hauled around in the back of an ambulance and he's confined to his tent. He has this trap perfectly set for Grant at the North Anna, but he's not able to give the orders to spring the trap. Uh, Longstreet by this point is wounded. He was wounded in the wilderness. Jeb Stewart is dead. Yule is sick, Hill is sick. There is no senior leadership. There's no one to step up and fill Lee's shoes while he's injured. And this is where he and Venable will butt heads. Venable goes into his tent one day while Lee is, is confined to his cot. And uh, Venable, of course, point blank tells him, you're in no shape to command this army, old man. Venable was the only one that could call him old man to his face and get away with it. No, so you're in no shape to command this army, old man. Send to Richmond and have them send Beauregard up here to take command. And that set Lee off. You know, when, when you get Lee in a bad mood, you don't want to argue with him. Venable either didn't care or didn't realize that. So the two of them are going back and forth here at it for a while. And, uh, uh, but Lee refused to give up command. And so this one golden opportunity here to, to turn the tide and turn Grant, possibly turn Grant back, it did not happen. And Lee would be... Uh, uh, ill for at least two weeks. And uh, it, it really cost the army. The, the army is, like I say, in essence, leaderless at North Anna. Uh, when they get to Totopotomoy Creek, they're still leaderless. And they're leaderless at the beginning at Cold Harbor. Uh, it's not until they've been at Cold Harbor for a couple of days when he's finally able to, to get up and about again. And uh, uh, here again, this is one of those instances where he, he tells Mary, I don't feel so good. So you know something was wrong. And we'll move on ahead quite a bit here to uh, October of uh, 64, getting towards the end here. By this point, it's become a two front war. Uh, the Army of Northern Virginia has been penned down at Petersburg, but Lee has to cover not only Petersburg, but Richmond as well. And he's getting tired of, of uh, uh, Grant being able to shift troops back and forth across the James at will. He wants to eliminate that Richmond front. So he's organizing an attack here the first week of October. And he gets together all the principal commanders, one of whom is this guy, Porter Alexander. And uh, Alexander, he wrote two memoirs, one which was for public consumption, the other was for his daughter and was never meant to be seen by the public. And that is the one that has the juicy stuff in it, including this little tidbit right here. Late in the afternoon, October 6th, I called at General Lee's headquarters. The general told me that he would start on the road at 2 a.m. and that I could join him as he passed my camp. Accordingly, we were up at one and at half past one had finished breakfast. I was smoking a cigarette by the fire when Colonel Venable rolled up, rode up. Alec, he said, come on, the old man is out here waiting for you and mad enough to bite nails. Why? It's only half past one and he told me we would start at two. Yes, Venable said, two o'clock was the hour he told us all last night, but now he swears that he said one. And he scalded, scolded everybody and started off alone and with no breakfast because nothing was ready. I overtook him and the rest of the staff are coming along as fast as they can get their horses. And it, this continues on. Uh, Lee actually uh, tells, uh, he asks Alexander, well, where's the guide? And Alexander says, what guide? You didn't tell me that we needed a guide. I thought you knew where we were going. And it, Lee goes off about that. You should have had a guide anyway. Then he tells Venable, well, you be the guide. Well, Venable didn't hear him. Venable was talking to one of Alexander's staff officers. Lee thinks Venable is ignoring him. This was without a doubt. The, the, worst outburst of Lee's temper throughout the entire war that we have on record. Uh, he thinks Venable is ignoring him. So he tells uh, either Alexander or somebody there, well, go over to that house and go get somebody. So they go over, they uh, 
uh, this elderly uh, gentleman comes to the door wearing nothing but a night shirt. Uh, and uh, Lee tells him, you're going to be our guide. Well, can I get dressed? No, get on the horse. Where are you going? I, you're just going to guide us. And they wouldn't let the guy get dressed. They wouldn't tell him where they were going. This was just a, a very bad morning uh, for Lee. And uh, Venable, or excuse me, uh, Alexander recorded this whole thing in uh, the uh, memoir that he wrote for his daughter. Lee has three headquarters uh, that he uses in Petersburg. The first one, Violet Bank, uh, was north of the Appomattox River. Lafayette had used it as a headquarters uh, uh, before, uh, during the revolution. And uh, that one became untenable because when the leaves fell off the trees, it was in plain view of enemy artillery. So he has to move into Petersburg itself, to this house. One of Walter Taylor's jobs is selecting headquarters. And he chooses this house. He can't believe his luck. He finds this Beautiful house, fully furnished, completely vacant, right in downtown Petersburg. The church that Lee goes to is right across the street. It's perfect. You know, any courier can find it. You know, even the dumbest courier on the planet can find this house because of its location. Taylor thinks he's lucked out. Uh, I took possession of a fine house, had Lee's room nicely arranged with a cheerful fire, etc. It was entirely too pleasant for him. He is never so uncomfortable as when comfortable. But they soon found out why this house was vacant. It had been rented by a newlywed couple. They had been at a church, not the one across the street, they had been at another church getting married when Taylor came in and occupied the house. And uh, when they show up, they see all these officers there. What are you doing in our house? Uh, well, this is, this is General Lee's headquarters. Well, what do you mean your house? We've rented this house. This is where we're spending our honeymoon. Oh, well, no, you're not. <laughs> and so they, uh, this uh, family or the, this couple, moves into a uh, house uh, nearby the whole time, keeping tabs on what's going on over here at, at their house. And finally, when, uh, when Lee goes to Richmond one day, they sense that that's their opportunity to strike. So the husband goes over there, tells Taylor, get out. Lee's not here to back you up. Get out, we're moving in our house. And so when Lee comes back from, uh, uh, from Richmond, uh, one of the staff has to meet him at the train. Uh, well, uh, how, was your, how was your trip, General? Fine. Okay, well, come with me to, to our new headquarters. New headquarters? What are you talking about? So on the, the ride farther out uh, to the home of William Turnbull, uh, whoever this officer was, I forget which one it was, explaining to him why, why and, uh, and how they had been evicted from this house here at, uh, in downtown Petersburg. They will move to this place right here, Edge Hill. And here's another one another excerpt from Taylor that I want to quote to you. This is from one of his letters to Betty. Uh, the only house available was one some two miles from town. So bag and baggage, we came to Edge Hill. And here I am finally fixed in the parlor with piano, sofa, lounges, pictures, rocking chair, etc. Everything as fine as possible for a winter campaign. After fixing the general and the rest of the staff, I concluded that I would have to occupy one of the miserable little back rooms of the house. But Mr. Turnbull hinted that I might take the parlor. And this decided me. So instead of giving Lee the best room in the house. Taylor is taking it, taking the best room for himself. I believe the general was pleased with his room and on entering mine remarked, ah, oh, you're finally fixed, but couldn't you find any other room? No, I said, but this will do. I can make myself tolerably comfortable here. Lee was struck dumb with amazement at my impudence and soon vanished. Uh, that's one of those things where, you know, Lee just, because Lee would appreciate things like this, you know, he walked away with a twinkle in his eye, you know, mumbling, you know, both cursing and praising Taylor under his breath as he walked away. But uh, Lee described when he was recounting this incident to Mary, he mentioned that the, the room that he was stuck in, uh, the, the miserable little back room that uh, uh, Taylor thought he might have to get, the door didn't close all the way. And it was the only room in the house where the Turnbull pets, their dogs and cats could go warm themselves by a fire. So every night Lee was being besieged by Turnbull's dogs and cats coming in and climbing on the bed to get warm. So I just, uh, for those of you that have seen uh, uh, Mad World, I have the sense of this picture, you know, the thing where Spencer Tracy winds up in the, in the pet store at the end and all the dogs are looking and that's this image that I have of Lee, all these dogs surrounding him. Anyway, last one. On April 2nd, 1865, this is when Petersburg falls and it's the beginning of the end. Lee has quite a few things on his mind, uh, not just the uh, collapse of his lines and uh, potential disaster here, uh, that morning, A.P. Hill and Longstreet are at, uh, are at his house or at his headquarters uh, consulting. And uh, before dawn, uh, Charles Marshall bursts into the room and announces that uh, Union forces have broken through Hill's line. 
Hill immediately gets up, runs out of the room, gets on his horse, goes to investigate, makes it about two miles up the road and is killed before he ever uh, found his own troops. Um, so that's problem number one and problem number two. Lines are broken, Hill is dead. Lee also, during the course of the morning, finds out that his daughter, Agnes, whom you see right there, is in Petersburg. She had come down a couple of days previously to visit with her father, but because of union movements, they were never able to connect up. Lee thought she'd gone back to Richmond. She was still in Petersburg. There's very good chance that Petersburg is going to be captured and before it's captured that there's going to be street fights. Lee is very concerned for his daughter. And while he's busy giving orders here at the Turnbull house, he turns to an officer, takes off his general hat, his figurative general hat for a minute, puts on his, uh, his father hat, pleads with this officer, please go find my daughter, get her out of here before it's too late. So this uh, officer from the uh, 12th Virginia Cavalry somehow manages to find Agnes and all the confusion in Petersburg. The two of them get on a train back to Richmond. It's the last train to leave Petersburg that day. And uh, as luck would have it, she gets back in Richmond just in time for the evacuation fire. So uh, uh, out of the frying pan and into the fire here, if you will, uh, almost literally. Uh, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. He thought he was uh, uh, getting her out of harm's way, not realizing what was going to happen in Richmond later. Um, as Union troops approach Edge Hill, uh, there's really nothing between Lee and the oncoming enemy troops except for one battery of artillery that unlimbers in the front yard, and it manages to draw even more attention to headquarters, and in the resulting fighting, the house burns to the ground. Uh, and then to cap it all off, at the end of the day, after Lee has finally managed to secure his lines and has everything set for a retreat to Amelia Courthouse, Walter Taylor uh, comes up to him, and you have to admire the young man's pluck, uh, especially given everything that's going on. Uh, he, he tells Lee, uh, General, uh, I promised Betty that we would get married before we left Petersburg. Is it all right if I go to Richmond tonight so we can get married? And uh, instead of exploding at how inappropriate that was, Lee actually agreed to it. And so uh, Taylor goes off to Richmond, and while most of the city is burning, Taylor is getting married and uh, he will rejoin the army at Amelia Courthouse the next day. And that, uh, that march, of course, would end at Appomattox Courthouse, where the army surrenders on April 9th, 1865. Uh, Lee's uh, war officially comes to an end uh, about a week later. Uh, he would remain at Appomattox until the 12th. Uh, he does not stick around for the, uh, the laying down of arms. Uh, he's, he's present at his headquarters when it starts, but he's not part of the, uh, part of the ceremony. He and the staff and, and several others will uh, ride off to Richmond. They have an escort of Union Cavalry and Honor Guard, if you will, that Lee did not want. So he, he told them to go back after they went about a mile or so. Um, they will uh, uh, take three days getting back to Richmond. Uh, one of Lee's uh, sons will join them as well as uh, some others. And uh, they will return to Richmond on April 15th, fittingly in pouring down rain as uh, Lee rides across the uh, uh, pontoon bridge that the federal forces had laid across the James word very quickly spreads that he has arrived back in town and huge crowds turn out along the streets uh, just to, to see him pass. Uh, men, women, blue, gray, black, white, hundreds of folks supposedly turned out just to watch him pass. Nobody said anything to him as far as we could tell, but they, they just wanted to watch him pass as he went uh, to his house on Franklin Street. And that, was the end of the war for Lee. Uh, and he would uh, survive until October of 1870. Um, the one question that folks always ask me is, uh, you know, it, if Lee was that difficult to get along with, if, if the members of his staff really, you know, did not, did not like being around him all that much, well, how did they feel about him after the war? And I think this picture really sums it up uh, better than anything I could ever uh, conjure up in, in terms of a, uh, a response. Uh, this was uh, Taylor's son, his first son that was born after the war. You'll note he was named Robert Edward Lee Taylor. And so with that, I will be glad to entertain any questions. Now we have one. Yeah. Although you mentioned that he was difficult to work with, you really Honestly, the, the letters you showed Mr. Taylor, um, quite frankly, to the contrary, that, that he was very approachable. 
and very easy to uh, speak to. That quote at the beginning, that was from one of his books that he wanted the people to read. I didn't include a lot. I could have gone into more detail, but we'd still be here for another hour if I went into detail. Uh, every one of his long-serving staff members tried to leave the staff at least once because of how difficult he was. Taylor would frequently complain to Betty about how difficult Lee was, about how uh, Lee was, you know, he, he never seemed appreciative of anything that they did. Uh, there's only a handful of them doing far more work than they should be doing. Um, the, the Venable is the, the prime example uh, of butting heads with them. Um, there are quite a few incidents during the war, and it, it usually just sprang up over minor stuff, you know, nothing that was really noteworthy, where they would, uh, you know, uh, Lee would uh, get irritated with them, you know, and when Lee held a grudge, he held a grudge for a while. You, you can ask Venable about that. They would go for days without speaking. Uh, but like you said, Lee always made up for it. Uh, there was a time, um, I think it was somewhere in Petersburg, he and Taylor had gotten into, into it about something. And they weren't speaking uh, that evening. And then the next morning, uh, Lee had gone to Richmond, but Taylor found where he had left him a peach. And it was small things like that, that, that Taylor and the others, you know, it, it said, you know, they, they cited that as evidence that, you know, yes, he was difficult, but yes, he did care. This was his way of trying to make things better. Uh, a peach was Taylor's favorite fruit. Lee knew that somehow or another, he managed to get a peach and he left it as a peace offering for him. Um, he and Marshall, I think it was Marshall, had had it out at some point during the uh, retreat from Gettysburg. They were crossing over the Potomac and uh, Marshall had said, I think it, was, it could have been Venable, one of the two of them had said something within earshot of the troops that were passing by about uh, the situation doesn't look good, sir. And Lee jumped on him, don't ever say anything like that where the men can hear you. And, you know, that of course, you know, led to another, you know, spat of non-talking. And whichever, again, I can't remember which one of the two it was, Marshall or Venable, whoever it was, uh, laid down to take a nap. It was pouring down rain. Lee took off his own poncho to cover him up and rode on and left him there to sleep. So whenever they had a spat like that, Lee would do something to, to make up for it. So uh, if we had more time, you know, I, I could give you more examples of, of what they were talking about. But all of them at one point tried to leave the staff. Uh, it's all kind of eventually, yeah, he couldn't take it anymore. He did leave the staff and, and went to another assignment. Um, the uh, chief of staff, Robert Chilton, uh, there it's a combination of the rest of the staff didn't like him and he got tired of Lee. He left for a desk job in Richmond. So yeah, he, he made life miserable at times, but he, he would make up for it. But, you know, as in all things, you know, when you look back, you know, they, and they were telling folks about it, they didn't want to highlight the bad stuff. You know, when they're writing for public consumption, they, they were going to tell you the good stuff, you know, that human nature, you know, you, when you're looking back, you know, you don't focus on the bad times most of the time, you focus on the good stuff. But yeah, it's a very valid point. I'm trying to check online. Okay. Yeah, I think I So it looks like we do not have any questions from our online guests. We would like to thank everyone for coming out today. If you are interested in Mr. Knight's book, it is available for sale in the museum shop and Mr. Knight will be available to sign the book also out in the lobby at the table. But again, thank you very much and we hope to see you on February the 2nd at 12. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.